All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And is everybody ready to lose if you're not on my team on the treasure hunt? Who you wish. <laughs> <laughs> Who's really competitive here? I won the treasure hunt. I did the church one. Ah, uh, 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 <laughs> uh, my team won. So okay, yeah. I said, Ruth, we might need to switch up the teams. I think I want Sarah on my team. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, it, it's okay to be competitive, it's just a game. I know, I know sometimes in Christian circles, people feel like they can't be competitive, like like you're not allowed, like it's not kind or nice. It's just a game. It's all right. We can be competitive and have fun with it and, and not take it personal. Amen? Amen? Right? Maybe? Hopefully? All right. <laughs> Everyone looking forward to the barbecue? Yeah? Oh, yes. And uh, it's going to be a, a, a really fun time. Thank you so much for Sonia for organizing us. And... Uh, as I said before, it's something I've been wanting for us to do for a long time, but being from California, the whole having to come up with a rainy day contingency is completely bizarre to me. I mean, I, I get that it has to be done, but I just don't know how to do that because we really, truly can plan a barbecue a decade in advance. You can choose the yeah. day, and the weather is so predictable. Oh, it did rain in California yesterday. In parts, yeah, yeah. Well, my friends are posting to rain, they're all like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but, but it feels a bit apocalyptic when it rains in August in California. This is true. To do. This is true. Although in the mountains, yeah, they, they it, you know, in, in the inland areas, it's not uncommon. Oh, no, this is like proper Sacramento; they're all freaking out. Yeah, but, <laughs> but yeah, that whole weather system there that is a little different. Anyways, so. Um, this morning, we are continuing our series in Ephesians. I'm just going to pray really quick. Uh, Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to uh, just be together, um, to have prayed and worship together as a family this morning, um, to enjoy uh, just fun this afternoon. Um, and I thank you right now that we get to get into your word for us, um, that you gave through your chosen vessel, the Apostle Paul, um, to the church in Ephesians, uh, in Ephesus. Uh, to the Ephesian church, uh, but it also applies to us. Uh, thank you for being such a wise God that you are able to um, craft words through your people that apply for generations uh, and until you return to call us home. Um, Lord, I pray that you would speak through me, that you would speak to our hearts and minds, and that we would receive those things that we really need to receive to be able to grow more and more in your image and likeness, to challenge the things of this world that we have held tight to, um, and to let them go so that we can have more space in our lives, to have more of you in us. I pray these things, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So, good morning again. And, um, whether you're joining us in person or if you're online, um, and we're continuing our study in Ephesians. And last week I covered chapter 2 of Ephesians. If you missed it or have missed any other part, it is on our YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. Um, all the Facebook it gets buried as the week goes on uh, with other scripture posts. Um, so YouTube is an easier place to get it and get caught up. Um, today's message does refer back to last week quite a bit uh, because really chapters 2 and 3 probably should have been kept all together. Um, but uh, I believe we will look at all of chapter 3 today. It's not terribly long. Um, so last week in chapter 2, I talked a little bit about uh, that God prepared good works for us to do in advance uh, of us even coming to faith in Christ. And that means that you, each one of you, and every person has a God-given purpose things that God has already designated for you to do. And some of these things you may have already done. Some of these thing, things you may be actively engaged in doing um, in this season in your life. And others still you may not have done yet. There are some people who have an understanding of what exactly those good works are that God has for them to do. And... If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry, you're in good company, because there are a huge portion of people who have absolutely no idea what God has called them to do, whether they are um, practicing Christians or not. So in Christianese, 
Um, and if everybody familiar with the term Christianese? It's what I call the, the words that get used a lot in, in church, in Christian circles, between Christians, that somebody who is not a Christian wouldn't know what those words mean. Um, and a lot of people who are in church, who are Christians, might even use those words but don't actually know what they mean. We just, you know, sometimes we parrot things that we hear and don't actually truly understand them. Things like um, sanctification, right? How many people walk around talking about sanctification? Um, you know, not a lot of people, but it is a very important word um, in Christianity because it means um, being made holy. Um, that. That, that God uh, sanctifies us, he makes us holy. Um, and it's something that begins at a certain point in time, it continues, con um, and it ends at a certain point in time. It's something that God is doing with us, um, that he will do with us, and that he has done with us once we come in vain. Um, and so that's an example of a Christianese word. Um, and so the idea of someone's calling, right, is... Somewhat of a Christianese term. It use, is used sometimes in the business world as well, borrowed from Christianity. Um, and the idea of calling, well, that is um, what it is that those good works are that God prepared for us in advance, that we're called to walk in, that we're called to do. That is our calling. Um, so the Apostle Paul, he had a good understanding of what his calling is, and he begins to talk about that more in this chapter, chapter 3. Now, if you have no idea what your calling is, if you have no idea what God has um, gifted you to do, um, and if you haven't yet done uh, the new members class for New Nation Church, um, in the third of those, it's called um, Who Am I? So we have uh, four classes in our new members class. Um, uh, who is he, as in who is God? Um, who are we? Who is the church? Who am I? And um, so it's a lot of self-discovery. So one of the things we include in there is spiritual gifts tests. Um, and also redemptive gifts test um, that helps you understand a little bit about who God has made you to be and how that may work out in your life. And then the fourth is how do um, he, we, and I all fit together? And, and so um, how do you apply how God has made you into your life in Christ? So if you haven't done the new members class yet, I highly encourage you. Um, they will be on a Tuesday evening um, to be announced um, next week. I'll set the official dates, but we'll start later in September um, and, um, and do September and, and part of October. Um, we'll just do four weeks in a row. Um, so I highly encourage you to take part in those. Little side note, little plug for that. But it is helpful. It is helpful. So Paul is somebody who did understand his calling. And in chapter, in verses... One through five, here we get a little bit of the sense of Paul understanding and living out God's calling, God's purpose for him. And he says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Now, <clears throat> when Paul says that he is a prisoner of Christ Jesus, what he's referring to is that he was literally in prison in Rome, when he wrote this letter, and that he was put there because of God's call on his life. It was part of God's purpose in his life. Um, and that was to bring the gospel to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. Um, and that often put Paul in conflict with both the Jews and the Roman authorities. Because the Jews um, didn't think that anybody who wasn't a Jew had any right, any access to God. And somehow, um, Paul is preaching that through Christ, that even the Gentiles have access to God. And that was just a horrifying thought to a lot of Jews. Um, and a lot of Jews didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. A lot did, and a lot did come to faith. Um, but the idea that somehow 
people who weren't Jews had access to God or could have access to God. They just thought that was, you know, that was wrong. How could such a thing be? They were the chosen people and no one else. Um, so in the mystery that he writes about um, that was made known to him by the holy apostles, that was made known by the holy apostles and prophets of Christ is this. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So that's him talking about his purpose, the good works that God prepared in advance for him to walk in. Um, according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of his power, to me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. So for Paul, he understands that his calling to the ministry of apostle is a gift of grace. God's unearned, unmerited favor and blessing upon Paul that took him from being somebody who was very much against Christ. Um, if, if you are familiar with how Paul came to Christ, uh, came to faith in Christ on the road to Damascus, um, and he had this vision, and, um, and in the vision, uh, Jesus says, Paul, why are you kicking against the goads? Um, and um, I love that phrase because it's, it's very graphic, and it's something that we don't think about today. Does anybody know what a goad is? No, you, you hear the term. Somebody. What's that? You goad someone. Yeah, you goad somebody on, right? Yes. Um, and so it's a big, giant, pointy stick, <laughs> right? That's that's a goad. Um, but uh, kicking it against the goads has to do with um, chariots um, back in the day. And so the chariots were designed, and they had these two big, pointy sticks that came out of the the um, the I don't know what you call it, the car. And uh, and if, if a horse were to go too far or to kick, they would hit this big pointy stick. Um, and it meant that they were going the wrong direction. And so um, Jesus appears to Paul on the road to Damascus and says, Paul, what are you doing? You're going the wrong direction. Why do you kick against the goads? Uh, you kick against the goads, it hurts, right? Um, and that's why there are these sharp pointy sticks is to get the attention of, of the horse or other beast of burden and say, don't do that, you know, it's gonna cause harm stay on the path that you're supposed to be going. Um, and so Paul understood, he came to understand that his call as an apostle to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles, was a gift of grace because um, Paul even coming to faith in Christ himself at all was a blessing, was a gift of God's grace. Um, because Paul was persecuting the church, he was known as Saul uh, before in that way he was behaving. And, uh, and so he was very much going against Christ. And because God is full of grace, he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you favor. I'm going to give you something you don't deserve. I'm going to give you this blessing of forgiveness for persecuting my people. And through that, you're going to understand when you give your life over to me that I've got a purpose for you. I've got a calling. And that reality is the same for all who are in Christ, for all who have said yes to Jesus. Every single one of us has a calling, has a purpose. It's not all to be apostles. Um, it's not all to be prophets. It's not all to be pastors or preachers or teachers. Some are called to be the best um, physicians they can be, the best cafe managers they can be, um, the best grandparents they can be. Um, you know, uh, there's all sorts of calling that we have, um, and God desires, and he plans these good works in advance. You know, the, the vision that Sonia shared, for example, um, that's a good example. I mean, it, 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 it's, it, it's very clear that God had um, a good work for her to do in advance, and he, and he gave her an understanding of that. Um, in a very clear way. A lot of times we don't have as much clarity as that, but through this situation, through an automobile accident, um, somehow she was able to demonstrate the goodness of God to the other people who were involved in that. 
Um, and so think about and pray about and ask the Lord as you go about your life, Lord, what good thing might you have me do in this situation, in my daily life? How can I be a vessel for your goodness, for your glory, in whatever situation I'm going through? So, again, Paul, he calls himself the least of all the saints. Um, and he understood that because of his behavior before when he was persecuting the church, that he really shouldn't have any portion in Christ. And yet because of God's grace, because of God's love, Paul was called to this great purpose. And we should all be thankful because probably in some way, shape, or form, all of us are, you know, many, 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 many generations later, part of Paul's story, right? Um, because it was through him, in large part, that the gospel came to people beyond the Jews. So, slide nine here, <clears throat> excuse me, verse nine. Uh, and to bring to light, so before I said, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery. Okay, the administration of the mystery. Okay, hold on, let's break that down a little bit. Uh, so that means how um, this mysterious thing um, that was a mystery for so long in the past that the, the Gentiles could have access to God through Christ, um, how does it get put into reality? So if you think of like, an administrator in an office uh, or in a school or wherever, um, the administrator has to do a lot of the practical things that actually make things function, right? Um, and, so, and to bring to light and to make clear um, how this is actually going to be put into practice and made to function. Um, and what is that mystery? Um, it is the mystery that the, God, that the Gentiles were always meant to be included. This was God's plan from the beginning, but it was hidden from the Jews, and now made clear um, through the apostles and prophets. So, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. So God hadn't made it clear, because the time wasn't yet. But after Christ ascended, and the gospel began to be preached and spread, it was time for that mystery to be brought to light, to be revealed. So that the manifold wisdom of God might, be, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Um, and so manifold wisdom of God, what does that mean? Um, anybody here into um, auto mechanics? Remember, cars used to have manifolds. I don't know if they still do. Okay, it's not talking about that. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> um, so the manifold basically means that God has all sorts of all kinds of wisdom, right? So He's wise in in all things, and He has a lot of that, that wisdom in all things. Um, and so that's something that we can be really thankful that. He is our God. So, in his manifold wisdom, it is God's purpose for the church, and I touched on this last week, um, that the church, which is all people who are God's household, his dwelling place, um, and again, remember the good works that I spoke about. Um, so, it is God's purpose, it is the good works for his church. <laughs> And an overarching purpose for all of God's people, and all of those good works feed into this overarching purpose, that we should what? That we should make known the manifold wisdom of God to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So that is for all people who are in Christ. That is a purpose for all of us, right? So if you've ever wondered what your purpose is, that's inherent in your purpose. How that plays out in your life individually will be different. Now, what does that mean? What does that mean? So, again, in Ephesians 2, 
um, we read about the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, right? That is an example of a ruler and authority in the heavenly places. That's the devil, that serpent of old, El Satan, which means the Satan, the accuser of the brethren. So he's one example, and he's a really good example for us because... He's sort of like the main one <laughs> that we need to deal with. Um, so, and again, the heavenly places doesn't necessarily mean heaven where God is. It means supernatural um, things that are outside of the physical realm. Um, and so those spiritual beings, those rulers, those authorities in the heavenly places um, can refer to the devil, to demons, but also to angels. Um, it is God's purpose for us to demonstrate God's goodness, his righteousness, his mercy, his grace, his justice, and his love, his manifold wisdom, to prove to all of those angels who rebelled against God, and also to those angels who made the right choice and stayed with God, that God is greater than any of them. That God is higher, that he is more wise, that he is more just, that he is more powerful. So, that is part of our purpose. Does that make sense? Right? In verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose. What is the eternal purpose? This was God's plan always. Always. And the angels had no idea that this was God's plan. Always. Not even Lucifer. Not even that serpent of old. He had no idea that that was God's plan. But God had this plan because he already knew what the devil was going to do when he tempted Eve in the garden. And he already knew that Eve would cave into the serpent's lies. And he already knew that Adam would also join in when the fruit was passed over to him. And so God planned all of this. God was wise to the serpent's trickery. Well before the serpent even hatched his plan. Right? So we see that manifold wisdom of God being demonstrated through God's people. And we are called to that purpose. To show the angels. To show the demons who God really is. And that they are nothing in comparison to him. That serpent thought that he had outsmarted God. And one third of all the angels thought that too. And they chose the devil. The accuser. Who by his very actions. Lived out an accusation on the character and power of God. And those angels that fell and became demons, they believed those lies. They believed those accusations. But God's purpose in all of this, again, because he knew it all before it even happened, or any of them even thought about it, includes us. God's purpose from before anything was created includes us. How amazing is that? And he continues, which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. So through Christ Jesus, who is 100% God and 100% man, God carries out justice through the giving of a life for the death penalty that is required as a payment for sin. Now that is something that is foundational to all of creation. That sin requires death. That's just how it is. Right? Somehow, that's a law of creation. And so because God is just and God is righteous, he has to enforce that law. Otherwise, that would be unjust. And so... A life has to be given for sin. And only through Jesus Christ, who is fully God and fully sinless man, the only sinless man, could the payment for all sin 
that ever existed be accomplished. The death of one who existed before sin. Think about that. Christ Jesus existed before sin was even a thing. Isn't that kind of mind-boggling to think about? So the one who existed before sin even existed is able to get below the root of sin and dig it out for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation. Salvation is available to all who will accept it. Not everybody will accept it. But Christ is able through the manifold wisdom of God to deal with sin in a way that upholds the righteousness and justice of God, that upholds this key foundational principle of all creation, that sin begets death. But he had a solution for that from before creation even existed, from before sin even existed, because God knew all of these things were going to happen. So, verse 12, in whom, which is Christ, we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore, I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. So I know I interrupted these verses quite a bit with explaining it, with explain <coughs> I'm just going to read it through. Uh, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things so that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access. I love that. Boldness and confident access through faith in him. Therefore I ask you not to lose heart at my tribulations on your behalf, for they are your glory. How is anyone's tribulation anyone else's glory? Right? Well, when someone is pushing through past their trials, past their hardships, because they know that God is going to use those to prove that the devil is nothing compared to God, that brings glory. It brings glory to God, and it also brings glory to all who are on God's side. Amen? So Paul's saying, look, you know, it's, it's not that big of a deal that I'm going through this stuff because you get to partake in the glory that happens because Paul is walking out those good works that God prepared for him in advance to walk in, right? Continuing on. For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom the whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Um, so here, some translations say every family, um, which is not literally a wrong translation. Um, but if you look at the context of what's being written here, that can actually be very confusing. Because it is clear, I hope it's clear, um, that God, that this is referring to the fact that God um, is father to those who are his children. And it's from the father that God's children get their name. And we already unpacked a lot of that in chapter 1 of Ephesians, uh, that not every person can claim God as their father, only those who are in Christ. So clearly this is about God's people, those who are in Christ, having our identity in God through Christ, as children of God who has adopted us into his family. Our Abba God. Abba is, uh, is a way of saying daddy. It's a very familiar term. Do you know you can call God Abba? You can call him daddy? Yeah? You can call him by, um, by a familiar phrase. By, you, know, you don't have to um, talk to him as if he's like some far off, stern, you know, mean figure. You can call him dad. Hey dad. Hey daddy. Abba, you know, whatever term of endearment is um, is comfortable for you to talk about that type of loving relationship, 
that you would always hope to be able to have with the dad. That's who God is as father to us, his children whom he has adopted. So we are named his children. So what would you guess is the name of the whole family in heaven and on earth? But today we would say Christians, but back then, um, the term Christian, um, even though it had come into existence, um, was still mostly being used by the pagan um, Gentiles as an insult against Christians. And they um, used to do that um, quite commonly, not only with Christians, but um, with other people. Um, if somebody followed a certain emperor or a certain general, or so, they, they'd say, oh, they're, they're the, um, the, the, the followers of, of Nero, but they're the followers of, 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 of Agrippa, or you know, whatever. Um, and so Christian was, oh, they're, they're the followers of Christ. They're the ones who are of the party of Christ. They're like little Christs. Um, and it was a way of sort of like, sort of, oh, the, you know, that's them. Um, and so the term Christian hadn't come to be fully embraced yet by, <clears throat> by Christianity itself. Um, and so it probably was a Christian. Before that, they were called followers of the way. Um, but now, we're starting to, what's that? I thought you had a guess. <laughs> so, um, I believe that that term was saint. That that's where we get the term saints as the name of God's family in heaven and earth. The saints. The saints, the holy ones. The ones who've been set apart in Christ. Because we talked about being in Christ and how the Gentiles have been also counted among the saints in God's household. So again, God's household is his, his children, his dwelling place. Um, we live in his house, but we are also his house. Um, and he dwells in, in us. And he therefore sets us apart. He makes us holy. We become his saints. So the Jews and the non-Jews together have been called his saints. So I'm going to put forth that saints is the family name that Paul meant here. And that Paul... There is referring back to what he wrote in chapter 2, verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So let's continue. Um, verse 16, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So God's own spirit, deep inside us, his children, deep inside of us, his saints, giving us his power to make us strong. And why? Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. So, here in these verses alone, we have like layer upon layer upon layer of how God wants to live in us and dwell in us. In chapter 2, we looked at us dwelling in Christ, and I used the example of, of God packaging us up in our faith and putting us in Christ, right? Um, and then here we read about Christ dwelling in our hearts. And both of these are through faith. And us in Christ, the Father, the Father Spirit, which is the Holy Spirit, inside of our inner man, inside of our soul. And then Christ dwelling in our hearts. And then we read about being fooled up to all the fullness of God. So again, more and more and more of God in us and us and God and God and God and God and us and us and God and God and us. And, and it's just this like, it's the sanctification in a way. It's this more and more transformation and more and more of God in us. It's pretty amazing. It's amazing that he would even want to do that, right? And he doesn't just want to do that. He loves to do that. And he's wise to do that. And he's good to do that. How amazing is our God? 
God wants to dwell in every part of us. Every single part of us. And I love these next verses here. Now to him who is, and this is the part I especially love, who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. To God be the glory forever and ever. The same God who is able who has the ability, the power, the wisdom, the knowledge to do not just a little more, but far more, a whole heck of a lot more, and not just that, but abundantly a lot more, beyond what we can even ask or think, or think to ask. And this is the same God who dwells in the inner man, in the soul of the believer in Christ Jesus, who then dwells in our hearts. And he fills us up with all of the fullness of himself. That God who is able to do a whole lot more in abundance, well, his power is working inside of us. Isn't that amazing? It's kind of shocking when you think about it, right? How much should that challenge and encourage us to ask for more than we feel comfortable asking for? How many of you have a hard time asking God for things that seem unreasonable? Three of you, four of you, five of you, all of you. Right? <laughs> I mean, it, it's, you know, and, and I think especially, I find in, in the UK as opposed to the US, um, in the US, you know, people will be a little bit more willing to ask um, things that seem to a lot of people over here in the UK to be like, oh my gosh, how could you ask God that? That's so outrageous. How dare you? You know? Um, but you know what? We can't even think to ask enough according to this, right? American or British, <laughs> right? Because God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all we ask or think, right? And it's according to the power that works within us, right? So why are we show so shy to ask? Why are we so afraid to ask things that are beyond our human understanding of how they might work out, right? We don't know how to know how things are going to happen. When we ask, when we pray, when we say, Father, I desire for there to be peace in this town, that there would be no riots. What happened? There were no riots. It didn't happen. God heard our prayers. Because he was more than able to do abundantly more than, and not only were there no riots, there were people protesting the fact that there might be riots, right? <laughs> so not only did the riots not happen, but something that was completely contrary to the riots happened, something much better. <laughs> so that's, that's a very, you know, very real example that happened here within just a short time ago. But there are all sorts of things that God can do that we need to have the trust in him and the faith in him and the confident, because we have confident access through Christ, right? Confident access. We can be confident, not in ourselves, but in Christ, in the faith that we have in Christ, that we have access to the Father, and that the Father dwells in our inner man, in our inner being, deep, deep inside, and that Christ through faith dwells in our hearts, and that God desires to fill, fill us with all of the fullness of himself, right? And his power dwells in us, right? Now part of this is surrendering ourselves to him, and having the mind of Christ, and, you know, and not playing, praying flippant 
self-centered prayers because that's not who God is and that's not in agreement with his character. But we can ask. We can and we should ask for those things that are beyond our limited human understanding. This should encourage us to pray big prayers and not have any doubt that God is able, more than able, to do the things that we pray for. And to also trust in him that if what we pray for does not happen, it has nothing to do with whether or not God is able to do it. Or even if we're praying enough. And learn to trust that if it doesn't happen, then God, who has and always has had the most amazing plan for purpose for us, his children, his church, his saints, since before anything was even created, that that, that God, our God, our Father, from whom we derive our name as his family, as his saints, has a better plan that we may just not understand. And that is even better in the big picture than what we could even ask or think to ask. Does that make sense? Are you following me? A few heads nodding. Have I lost you? No? All right. So I want to challenge us to start praying in faith. Because our God is a big God. And that we can pray big God prayers. And once you've prayed, that you can and should entrust those prayers to God and not try to second guess or make excuses or bring that burden back as we were talking about during worship this morning and bear that burden yourself or try to make it happen in your own strength. But just trust Him and in His love that He has demonstrated through Christ for us. That love that surpasses understanding. Amen? Let's use that as an encouragement. That God in his purpose for us wants to demonstrate his manifold wisdom to the powers and authorities in the heavenly places. And that we can pray big prayers. That we can ask and trust God with those things. And not bring them back onto ourselves. Not carry that burden. Because God is more than able, abundantly, to do those things. And in his wisdom, he'll do them or not. It's his wisdom, it's not ours. His ways are higher than our ways. Amen? Amen. So what big prayers would you pray? Don't answer that now. (laughs) We don't have time for that now. Um, unfortunately. Um, But pray those big prayers. Pray those big prayers. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed to ask. God is more than able. Trust him in his ability to do the things that he knows are the wise things to do. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to turn it over to Ruth and I think... We may do another song.